This morning, we are going to open up to the book of Jonah. And uh, I kind of wanted to start here in the book of Jonah. One, because in a way, we all can kind of identify with Jonah, I'm sure, at some level. And then the second reason is that it really drives home the character of God. And when I was a kid, uh, when I would think of what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, becoming a pastor probably was furthest from my mind. Um, I grew up attending a small Baptist church in Burton, Michigan, uh, where my grandfather uh, was the pastor. I believe he planted that church in the early 70s. And, uh, and so I kind of grew up attending the small Baptist church. I remember there was a deacon in the church. His name was Newt Stevens. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago. And he would often tell me uh, and my brother, uh, make comments about us following in our grandfather's footsteps. And this is when I was probably like seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, and he would just make those kind of side comments. I thought most of the time he was just joking. Uh, so I didn't really think anything of it. But then I remember an occasion when I was probably around 15 or 16 years old. He said it again to me, and I, it didn't come across as a way of joking at that time. And it was significant. It stuck with me uh, even until now uh, that I would someday follow in my grandfather's path of preaching the word. I never would have expected it. Now, fast forward a few years, I'm dating my wife, and at the time when we started dating, I was at best a nominal Christian. I, really, I didn't really have a good faith. I didn't really knew what it meant to follow Jesus. I just knew about Jesus. Uh, she was probably, she was at that point, maybe a, she was an atheist, but kind of exploring, so maybe more verging on the side of ag agnostic uh, and so we, neither one of us were really walking with Jesus. We had no idea what it looked like, but I had sort of this uh, stirring in my heart about a year, year and a half before I met her to, that I, I wasn't satisfied with my life. I wasn't satisfied with the direction things were going. And so I uh, felt just this strong urge and impression to start going to church again. And so naturally, I just went back to my grandfather's church. It was the only church that I ever knew. And so I would go to church each and every week, and uh, when I met Stacy and we started dating, at that point we were, we were pretty much inseparable right from the start, and so I invited her to church with me, and she came, and I remember after maybe a couple Sundays, she leaned over while my grandfather was preaching and said, do you think you would ever do that? Now obviously, pre preaching was never on my mind. Uh, I was barely even, I wouldn't even consider myself a Christian at that point. So it was a question that kind of came out of left field from someone who wasn't a Christian at that time and, and someone who, to someone who really was just kind of exploring and rediscovering what faith in Jesus looks like. And so it was at a complete surprise. And I'm pretty sure I swore in church that day because I was like, heck no, that was not anything that was on my radar. That was not any desire that I ever had, not anything that I've ever put thought to. But then I still remembered what uh, Mr. Stevens told me probably 10 years earlier. So that's always something that stuck with me. At the time, I was this operations manager for a facilities management company that was really growing exponentially. I had kind of worked my way up in this organization. I was in the top three of leadership, and so I kind of saw myself as being an executive leader. That was my career path. And ministry was never on that radar. So I went to business school, got a business degree, uh, and about the time I was finishing my business degree, uh, I had really became a Christian, and God started nudging me towards ministry, and I was resistant. I hated that call. I did not want that call, and so I resisted it. Around that time, there was a recession, so I was unemployed. I ended up being unemployed for about 15 months. My daughter was born, so I was stay-at-home dad for a little while, and all the while, I was still just resistant to that calling. I was not interested. And so I ended up taking a position as a director of marketing for a, a local organization. And the entire year I had that job, I absolutely was miserable. The reason why I was miserable, because I was rebelling against God. And I knew I wasn't doing what he had called me and made me to do. 
Now, I'm sure there are a number of people here in this room who can relate to some level uh, Jonah, and that's kind of who I was at that point. I was running and rebelling from God pretty much in the complete opposite direction. Now, none of us uh, do what God has told us to do 100% of the time. We've all at some time or another have known a clear call from God and responded with rebellion. And I think it's fine to sort of uh, find some commonality with uh, or relatability to Jonah or any other biblical characters, whether uh, it's King David, the Apostle Paul, or Peter, or Abraham. Our shared commonalities can help us to know that Scripture is written for us. It helps us to know that Jesus is for us. We're normal, everyday screw-ups who who need the grace and mercy of Jesus more than anything else. But here's the deal. The, The Scripture is written for us, but Scripture isn't written primarily about us. You know, we're part of the story, but we're not the point of the story. It's not primarily written as an instruction manual to show us how we're to live our lives, though practically speaking, we can certainly learn from the obedience of God's people and the disobedience of God's people in Scripture. We're part of the story, but we're not the point of the story. God's relentless love, His grace, His mercy, His power, His worthiness, His holiness, and so much more is the point of the story. Jesus is the point of the story. So as we dig into the book of Jonah, the whole point is to to reveal the depths of God's character and the truth of who he is. In Jonah, God is revealed to be patient and merciful, which ultimately points us to this most significant and the most miraculous, the most marvelous act of grace and mercy and sending Jesus to be the perfect sacrificial atonement for our sinfulness. That's why we read the word. That is why we study the word. That is why we cling to the word and and trust the word and believe the word. It's perfect and infallible and it gives us every detail we need to know about God to have a full and flourishing faith. So to put it simply, God's word is sufficient. God's word is sufficient. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to turn in the scriptures to the book of Jonah, and we're going to look at chapter 1 and explore this word that God has for us today. Jonah chapter 1. Before we get into the word, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to open your word together with this body of Christ for the purpose of seeing who you are and all that you've done in revealing your steadfast love your abounding grace, and your perfect forgiveness for those who have repented of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus alone. As we look to your word, I pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to hear and respond with humility, with adoration for all that you are. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Now, this calling on Jonah was not an easy calling. Uh, So in Jonah's defense, uh, prophets are, are called to herald the truth to people, especially those who are in rebellion of God. Yet Nineveh was probably as evil as they come. You could say that this would be a modern-day equivalent of a Jewish person entering into Hamas territory to proclaim the coming judgment of God. Now, Jonah, he didn't just ignore God's call. He completely rejected the call. The, The phrase, away from the presence of the Lord, is this Hebrew expression that indicates Jonah is doing far more than just fleeing the call of God. He's fleeing everything about God and his faith in God. He's taken the path of apostasy, 
He's leaving a lifelong pursuit of obedience to God and pursuing a path of disobedience. And so we're seeing this in today's culture. We see influencers on social media who have amassed large followings, uh, vocally pursuing Jesus, pastoring churches, leading people, but then something happens that compels them to deconstruct their faith. Now, not all deconstruction is bad per se, but it's when they start rebuilding back on something other than the truths of God in his word. It's when they begin to allow worldly culture, personal preferences, or their own truth override the perfection of God's word. But in Jonah's case, God's not going to accept this. Picking up at verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. Then they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and fast, was fast asleep. Now this wasn't a small storm. These were seasoned mariners, experienced sailors who likely have sailed through many storms, but the fact that this storm had them afraid for their lives is of significant importance. This was a major storm that God was using to get the attention of Jonah. And either Jonah was so committed to his rebellion that either he was so comfortable with the idea of dying on this ship or he was utterly seasick that he had passed out in the cargo hole. I don't know if you've ever been that seasick, but I have. (laughs) I was so sick that I was curled up in fetal position for like six hours and I fell asleep while my brother and my dad fished on Lake Erie one time. It was terrible for me. They caught a lot of fish. I did not catch any. We can't say for sure why Jonah was down there or why he was so content with sleeping. But in verse 6, it picks up. So the captain came to, and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise out, of, out and call to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a, a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to, said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So at this point, we basically see that Jonah is a liar. And his actions are completely contradicting everything he's just confessed. He, he says, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. But at this moment in time, Jonah has no fear of the Lord. He doesn't even appear to have any fear in death. And I think for him, this would be the surest way of avoiding to travel to Nineveh. Jonah has no fear of the Lord. And we do this each time we, we sin and give ourselves over to temptation. When someone commits adultery, they're not living in the fear of the Lord. They're living in the fear of the flesh. Instead of believing that God's way is the best way, they believe their heart or flesh is the best way. There's a fear that if they don't feed their fleshly desires, and by that I mean the darkened desires of the heart, then they miss out on the bliss of fulfillment. Here's what this sounds like in today's culture. It sounds like, Phrases like, follow your heart, or I'm living my truth. What uh, you do you, be who you are. God's enemy speaks a lie that says, if you pursue this desire, you will experience heaven on earth. But the true reality is that only Jesus can bring heaven to earth. Our only hope to even catch glimpses of heaven on earth is to live in obedience of the Father. Our only hope is to live in the fear of the Lord. Living in the fear of the Lord looks like a husband or a wife remaining faithful in their covenant between each other and God for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. Living in the fear of the Lord is like a man and woman entrusting their singleness or even their sexuality with the Lord of heaven and earth. It looks like 
trusting the Lord with how he supplies for you financially, whether it's a little or a lot, God knows exactly what's best for you and your relationship with him. Living in the fear of the Lord is trusting him with your children, whether you have one child or many children, and trusting him with their faith and salvation. Living in the fear of the Lord is responding to your call to ministry, whether it's vocational, bivocational, or non-vocational ministry. Living in the fear of the Lord is simply sharing the gospel with your neighbors or the barista at your favorite coffee shop. Not because you have to, but because you get to, because it's the greatest news to share. Living in the fear of the Lord looks like obedience no matter the cost, the risk, the danger, and it doesn't matter if you agree with God's plan or not. Here's the deal. God is not content with you following your heart unless it aligns with His. He's not content with you doing you unless your will is in alignment with His. And we've seen this since the Garden of Eden in the disobedience of Adam and Eve. We've seen this in the life of Jonah, and we see it in our own lives. We naturally don't desire to seek God, and we naturally don't desire to obey God. Obedience is something we must fight for, and by God's grace, we grow in it when we dwell in His Word and in His presence. The book of Jonah continues, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. because they, they, they didn't want Jonah's blood on their hands. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they uh, called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done what as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. If we let the point of Jonah remain purely instructional, you know, what to do, what not to do as a missionary of the gospel, then it's not uh, an incredibly impressive story. It could very easily be just a story or a fairy tale. But if we dig deeper into the true purpose of the story, we see the magnificence of God. Here, we, we start to see the goodness and the glory of God unfolding, and we'll continue to see it unfolding throughout the rest of the book. We see God do two things. God used Jonah's disobedience to draw the hearts of the shipmates. They've recognized their inability to save themselves in this situation, and, and they've developed this miraculous desire to please God. The word says that they develop this exceeding fear of the Lord. They're trusting in Him for their salvation. The second thing that we see God do is He extends great and miraculous mercy to Jonah in the form of a miraculous fish that was sent to preserve his life. What Jonah really deserved in his rebellion was to be judged by God and left to drown in the sea. But what God sent instead of his final judgment upon Jonah was mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting what you don't deserve. I don't know if you've ever heard it summed up like that. What we see in Jonah is a rebellious saint receives mercy and salvation, which only comes from Yahweh. Our God is the only provider of true salvation. So what, what do we do with this text? What does it mean for us today? And like a good Baptist, I'm going to give you three points. The first is to pursue God's will above your own. 
You have no power to derail or change the will of God. If God has called you, called something to pass, rest assured, it will pass whether you are obedient or not. And if His will requires your eventual obedience, then your obedience will come to pass whether you like it or not. Our God is Almighty God, and there is nothing you can do to overcome His will for your life and His will for this world. I remember in Sunday school learning the Lord's Prayer, which leads us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Most often we have to fight for the desire to be obedient to Almighty God, but even if we fail to fight, our disobedience will not derail the will of God. His will be done always and forever, whether we like it or not. But I want to invite you and encourage you, don't just fight for obedience. I want to invite you to pray intentionally and regularly for your heart to love the will of God and to grow in your contentment with Christ Jesus alone. (coughs) Pray to love the will of God and pursue it above your own. The second is to remember that you are saved by grace. God was not surprised by Jonah's disobedience, and like Jonah, God is not surprised by your disobedience or my disobedience. Jonah was a sinner saved by grace. And like Jonah, you are a sinner saved by grace. God is a God of compassion, and not only does he have mercy for the sailors, but he also grants mercy to Jonah and the unlikely form of a storm and a fish. Like Jonah, God loves you with steadfast Love and He provides for you the most significant means of salvation, and His name is Jesus. Jesus bore your sin. Jesus became cursed in your place. Jesus bore the wrath of His Father, standing in your place so that you could experience the fullness of forgiveness. And I want to invite you to take time to, to, to look at the moment that you realized your need for Jesus and worship God for saving you. Look over your life. And remember the ways that God has faithfully provided for you. Whatever the provision and celebrate the goodness of God. Remember that you are a people who are saved by grace. And the last point and invitation is to remain on mission. Remain on mission. Like Jonah, we are a sent people. You are sent ones, and you are sent in the power of the Holy Spirit with the most significant news the world will ever know. You possess the power through the, the speaking of the words of the gospel in partnership with the Holy Spirit to set captives free, to bring healing to the sick, to bring hope to the hopeless, to give a grieving widows loving kindness, to lift people's burdens, to literally bring the salvation of the Lord. You have the most important calling in all the world. And I want to invite you to take time this week to think of at least one person, maybe many people come to mind, and begin intentionally praying for them to come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. You encounter people every single day. Who in your life needs to know Jesus? And begin the process of praying for them. And also pray for ways that God may use you to help point them to Jesus. You are a sent people, a sent people to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to just spend a little time in Jonah and seeing your goodness and kindness, seeing your character and how merciful and kind and gracious you are. I pray, Lord, that this word would be a reminder to us to seek your will above our own, that you would help us to by, by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in obedience to your word and your calling on our lives, that you would help us to be intentional missionaries in our homes, 
in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our state, and beyond. You give us such great opportunity to preach the gospel. And so I pray that you would help us to do that for your glory alone, for the purpose of building up your kingdom. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.